to Lincoln because he just flew back from New Zealand and spent a 40-hour travel day. So let's be nice to Lincoln and help me welcome him to the stage. Lincoln Johnson. <laughs> Good luck, Lincoln. Thanks, Ian. You need this thing? Oh, yeah. All right. Um, I must say that when I started this journey, I never thought I'd be on a stage talking to this many people. So the topic is the past, present, and future of cannabis extraction. Um, and I always say that my crystal ball is really cloudy. I sure didn't see the email today coming in today. Um, touched on who I am, mechanical engineer from UBC. Uh, statistics and data geek, optimization is my thing. I take systems and make them better. Uh, recovering chef, that was my first career. Spent about 10 years in the restaurant industry. Uh, don't let this fool you, I'm actually in my 30s. Um, and I've been playing with extraction since the early 2000s. Um, when I was in culinary school, I uh, discovered that you could make um, green eggs and ham with butter. Um, that was great before class. Uh, don't do that anymore. Um, so the context of this presentation is large-scale production. Um, craft and home production play by different rules, if any. Um, I'm talking hundreds to thousands of pounds an hour. Anything less than that I consider to be craft or hobby scale. Um, and this is, again, only primary extraction methods. I only have half an hour. Um, I like to ramble, so I got to try and keep it to one single topic. Uh, Pre, post refinement, everything, there's way too much to cover in that. That's a week, not half an hour. The best process for whatever you want to do is the one that works best for what you want to do. There is no magic bullet. Um, a lot of equipment manufacturers will try and sell you on their thing. It's going to be good for one thing or a group of things. might not be best for you. Um, so before I get too far into this, um, how many companies in here um, are doing extraction? Very small numbers. OK. Um, how many are planning to or are cultivating and want to? None. OK. Uh, <laughs> so you're just here because there's only one talk track. Uh, <laughs> OK, so there's nothing new under the sun. Um, it's not actually true, but it's good enough for a first approximation. Um, trying to solve the problems that we're trying to solve by looking only at the cannabis plant doesn't make a lot of sense to me. We've been doing solvent-based botanical extractions for at least 5,000 years. Um, the Egyptian pharaoh Scorpion I, uh, in addition to having the coolest name ever, um, was found in a tomb with jars that had remnants of wine, tree resin, and aromatic herbs. So for at least 5,000 years, we figured out that if you put plants in booze, you get stuff out of those plants. Um, anyone who's been in college probably knows about Jaeger. Same thing. That's literally how they make it. They put it in a barrel, a bunch of herbs. Extraction is a simple process. Simple does not mean easy. Um, two basic ways of looking at this, mechanical separation. Um, for what we're looking at, you've got trichomes on the plant. You take them off. Um, other options are solvent separation. Again, simple process. You add solvent to the biomass, remove the solvent from the biomass, and then remove the desired target compounds from the solvent. You're now extraction experts. Go start a company. It's really that simple. Not easy. Um, there's four main extraction methods we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about, rather. Um, not going to touch on microwave, because I don't know enough about it, but I'd love to talk to someone from Radiant. Hey, there we go. We'll chat later. Um, solventless extractions. Trichomes, take them off the plant. That's powder, that's keef. You press it, now it's hash. Press it further with heat, now you've got rosin. Um, this, to my mind, is not an industrial process. Um, there is no well-refined process yet to do this at scale, um, at the scale we're talking about. This is still at the hobbyist prosumer level, to my mind. So, for solvent extractions, you've got alcohols, ethanol, methanol, isopropanol are the most common ones. Um, there's others, but these are the big ones. Hydrocarbons, butane, propane, other alkanes. Um, butane is kind of the big one, propane less so. Um, the other ones, not so much. And then CO2, which I'm sure most companies in this room that are doing extractions are probably doing CO2 for various reasons. So, brief 
bit on the history. Um, six, about 600 BC, the Sumerians used a cannabis concentrate type product, obviously we don't know exactly what it was, as a love potion for impotence, neuralgia, depression, and anxiety. Um, about a thousand years ago, the thousand and one Arabian Nights, um, there was the tale of the hashish eater and flying carpets. Pretty sure they had cannabis. Um, it's likely that Napoleon and his troops brought hash to Europe from Egypt in the 1800s. Obviously it was there before, but they probably popularized it. Um, the information on this slide comes from a paper by Dr. Ethan Russo. If I got anything wrong, it's my fault, not his. Um, so tinctures have been a thing for quite a while. Hash, uh, finger hash was initially from trimmers. You get the trichomes on your hand, you rub them together, now you've got hash. Um, created bubble and ice hash, uh, different ways of manufacturing those. Um, one of the first big solvent extractions for concentrates uh, was BHO, which kind of came onto the market about the 1970s, um, was then popularized with open blasting. Please don't do that. Don't blow yourselves up. Give, gives us all a bad name. Um, closed loop systems came into the market about the 1990s. Um, those, that's the safe way of doing it, and they're really not that expensive. Uh, Rick Simpson oil, RSO or Phoenix Tears, uh, came about in about the 2000s. Um, thankfully, all of the RSO and Phoenix Tears you get on the market today are not made with naphtha, which is what the original one was. Do not make an extract with naphtha. Um, you don't know what's in it. You can't purge it. It's really, really bad stuff. Slightly better than the cancer, but present. Um, so, I'm going to preface this with, again, all of the solvent extractions are tools in a toolkit. They have advantages and disadvantages. Um, we're going to have all three of them in our facility. So, CO2. This is the big one in the Canadian market right now. The equipment is big and slow and expensive. It's not solventless which the salespeople will try and tell you. Um, it is tunable, which means that by adjusting the temperatures and pressures, you can preferentially remove certain compounds from the plant. Really, really good for terpene extraction. If you want to pull the terpenes off of your biomass, CO2 is the way to do it, except for some of the monoterpenes, but whatever. It's really good for extractions and procedures that don't require winterization or precipitation of the fats that come out with it. Um, hops. Decaffeinating coffee, lavender. Really bad for cannabinoids. The solubility of cannabinoids in CO2 is about half a percent. So for every gram of CO2 you're flowing past your biomass, you get about 50 milligrams of cannabinoids out. Um, for reference with ethanol and hydrocarbons, that number is between 20 and 40 percent, uh, depending on the temperature and the pressure you're looking at. Hydrocarbon, alkanes. Uh, you've got the um, chains with three and four carbons. These are gases, propane, and butane, isobutane. Five to seven are liquids, pentanes, hexanes, and heptanes. Um, lower and higher alkanes aren't used much in cannabis, um, not at scale. I know people doing really interesting things in labs, but that's lab work. What are they good for? All the rec products that you see. Shatters, waxes, butters, hydro, or, um, butters live resins. Hydrocarbons are great because they boil off at a very, very low temperature. That means that when you purge the solvent, the terpenes stay in your product. Bad for high volume extraction and facility cost. I went and I talked to the uh, fire marshal that needs to approve my facility uh, in a municipality of about 1,800 people, and I said, I want to have a tank with 100,000 liters of butane in it, and I'm going to make drugs. <laughs> Not so good. Um, it can be done, but a little bit harder. Alcohols, my personal favorite for the most part uh, in this context. Um, ethanol, methanol, isopropanol, um, they all have different properties, different polarities, um, which allow you to do different things. Um, a stronger polarity will pull more chlorophyll, a lower will pull uh, more fats and waxes. Uh, ethanol is a really nice happy medium for all three of these really good for high volume refined product production. If all you want is distillate, if you want an input for your edibles, for your brownies, um, for your gummy bears, for anything like that, pharmaceutical products that are standardized, this, to my mind, is the best way to do it. Because on a dollars to dollars basis, you can process about 10 times as much with a alcohol-based system as you can with a hydrocarbon or a CO2 system. 
Not so great for terpene retention in the final product. The way that everyone does alcohol extraction right now is you get the solvent into the biomass, you separate them out, and then you boil off the ethanol. Ethanol doesn't boil until 50 or 70 degrees Celsius, depending on the pressure you've got it at. You lose a lot of terpenes. So you don't get that nice saucy texture. It's hard to make an ethanol shatter. You can do it, it's difficult. Also tends to pull lots of undesirables. It will also pull the fats and waxes. It will also pull chlorophylls. These are products that you have to remediate. Or you do the extraction at say minus 70 Celsius and you don't pull any of those things. Problem is that's also expensive. So there's a trade-off with all of these technologies. So the future. My crystal ball is cloudy. I, when I was at MJ Biz, I was at a um, event for extractors, and there was about 70 or 80 people in the room. And the first presenter stood up and said, okay, how many people here um, are doing hydrocarbon extracts? And about half to two thirds of the people put up their hands. I said, how many people are doing um, ethanol extracts? Same thing, about half to two thirds of the people, because many people do multiple kinds. I said, how many are doing CO2 extracts? I can't remember the exact number, but it was single digits. I think it was five or eight. And he said, how many people used to do CO2 and now have a piece of equipment that they've sold or that is sitting in a shelf gathering dust? And about half the people put up their hands. CO2 is not a high volume process for cannabinoids. It just doesn't work all that well. So where are we going? Let's look at other industries. We've been doing botanical extractions for 5,000 plus years. Cannabis is new-ish to this, but we can look at pharmaceuticals. We can look at perfume industry. We can look at all of these other industries that are solving really similar problems. People have done PhDs on the problems that we're trying to solve. Go and find their thesis papers. Edible oil production, canola oil, really large scale hexane. I had someone tell me the other day, you will never be able to do large scale hexane extraction for cannabis, it's not possible. The regulator won't, let, won't allow it. There are hexane extraction plants with hundreds of thousands of liters of hexane doing hundreds of thousands or millions of pounds a day of extraction. It can be done, read NFPA 40, 36. Nutraceuticals, really large scale alcohol extraction. Um, they make a lot of concentrated tinctures, basically. Pharma, you name a solvent, they use it. It's worth it for them. They use it at scale. Learn from their, um, their processes. What lessons can we learn? Where do we want to go? What do we want to learn from these companies? We need to reduce our production costs. Right now, the cost of cannabinoids is as high as it's ever going to be. It will never be this high again. It's only going down. That means your production cost needs to go down if you want to stay competitive. You reduce those through economies of scale, reducing your energy usage. And if you're doing solvent extractions, don't phase change your solvent if you can avoid it. It's really expensive on an energy basis. Reducing your labor requirement, automation, automation, automation. Humans are really, really, really bad at repetitive tasks. We get bored, we get distracted, we wanna see what's on Facebook. Um, I, in a previous life, had a startup building um, predictive analytic systems for oil and gas. I worked with a company that had a exothermic event because they had an employee that had to sit and watch a bank of screens. And their entire job was to notice when a needle went below a certain mark. And that person didn't notice that and then went on vacation and no one else looked at it. Um, and they had a million dollar problem because they had a human doing an extremely repetitive task. Um, that human made a mistake. They get sick. They also don't work 24 seven and they require overtime. So get the robots to do what they're good at. Reduce your losses. Solvent loss, consumables. Um, my big thing is don't extract things you don't intend to keep. If you're doing an alcohol extraction and you're pulling chlorophylls and you're pulling fats and waxes and then you have to remediate those, doesn't make a lot of sense. I talked to one company I was doing room temperature alcohol extractions, and they were doing a carbon scrub to pull all of the chlorophyll out. They didn't have in-house analytics. Then when they brought them in, they realized they were losing 30% of their cannabinoids when they scrubbed that chlorophyll. They then spent about $150,000 retooling, went to a minus 70 cryo process, 
And that paid for itself, I think, in a month. Understand your process and understand where your losses are. In the medium term for us, I see high volume production. Um, also craft, but again, that's not really the context of this talk. Increasing, increasing specialization. Unless you're canopy, if you got billions of dollars in the bank, you can specialize in everything. It's great, that doesn't work for pretty much most anybody else in this room. Um, find one thing, be really good at it. Let other people be really good at their thing. Pharmaceutical level refinement, I think, is where this industry is going and needs to go to gain the acceptance of the wider market. Also, to export. You have to be GMP, you have to be pharmaceutical standards to get there. CBD and versus THC, I think in five to 10 years, CBD is probably gonna be four to 10 times the market for THC. You can go on everything. You're gonna see CBD in toothpaste. Doesn't mean that it's a good idea, but it's gonna be there. <laughs> Doesn't have to be a good idea to sell it to people. Um, and it looks like I talked really fast. So, which I tend to do. Um, are there any questions? What were you doing in New Zealand? <laughs> um, relaxing, mostly. My first vacation in five years. Um, also scouting for locations. Um, New Zealand is going legal, or is likely to go legal in 2020. Um, I think that New Zealand is a really good target for international expansion for Canadian companies. Um, they have a very good reputation in the world market. Um, as does Canada, and they are, um, they got a lot of advantages. And also, I love the climate, so I want an excuse to move there. Time for lunch then. Oh, oh. Just to let you know, the microwave process is uh, very, very quick and doesn't require winterization and uh, uh, whatever the, the, the other aspect around uh, recovery rates are very, very high in continuous flow as well. So uh, it covers off with the, the issues that you mentioned about ethanol extraction. All right, let's chat later. Thank you. Oh. I hear a lot about ethanol extraction, but uh, ethanol to purchase is heavily taxed by the Canadian government, even absolute ethanol for R&D purposes. So I was wondering if there's a, a combination of solvents that you've tried that kind of reduces your requirements to rely on ethanol that gives you kind of the same um, terpene cannabinoid profile when you're doing extractions. Yes. Um, so you can use denatured alcohols, um, so uh, SDAG9, I believe, is the one that we were looking at, um, which is basically 95 parts ethanol, 5% part percent methanol, makes it not drinkable, it's not toxic. Um, what you can do instead is you can apply for an excise exemption from CRA. It requires a lot of paperwork, but it saves you about $13 a liter. Um, so my cost for ethanol is going to be about $1.70 a liter. Um, you need to, it's it's a paperwork process, it's a tracking process, um, but you can remove that beverage excise. Um, using other solvents, I haven't found any um, denatured alcohol grades that don't have negatives to them. Um, there's one that works really, really well in, in the US. Uh, it's a heptane denatured, so by 710 spirits. Um, we can't use that here because heptane is not an acceptable denaturant in Canada. So um, apply for your excise exemption. It's worth it for the tens of thousands of dollars a week you're going to save. <laughs> All right. I think that's it.